All right, welcome back. Good to have you uh, with us here on the Wednesday edition of the South African Morning. Let's talk money, specifically let's talk currencies. Uh, obviously a major impact on how trade is conducted. Recently, African economies have been struggling to find the foreign currency they need to actually pay for imports. Also always a bit of an issue when they're exporting uh, in their local currency, buying back uh, in the currency of the country they've sold to. Now, according to the latest findings by the Standard Bank Africa Trade Barometer, this is caused by the depreciation of local currencies within their own country, as well as higher interest rates. We know how that affects us here in South Africa. The barometer focusing and concentrating on 10 countries. Among them, let me give you uh, some of the names, South Africa, Angola, Ghana, Kenya, Mozambique, Namibia, uh, and the powerhouse Nigeria. Let's find out just uh, why this is so important and what do they actually do with this data. Uh, Philip Myberg, Head of Trade at Standard Bank. Philip, good to have you on ENCA. I appreciate this. Why put together a report like this? What are you trying to achieve? Let's just start there. Thanks, Gareth. Good morning. So we found in, in engaging our clients, engaging policymakers, engaging the academia, that there's a massive void in the market with regards to really understanding what's happening on the ground. What are small businesses are saying about how government is supporting them to trade better? What are some of the challenges they're facing on a daily basis? The easy data points come from the World Bank, World Trade Organization, etc. But those tend to be dominated by what large companies and multinationals are saying. So there was a void that we felt with our uh, footprint that we have, with the resources that we have, that we could fill. And it's been very well received. This is our third issue so far, and um, we're hoping that it influences policy and, and, and encourages different approaches to, to increase trade on the continent. Yeah, and because there's been some talk, uh, Philip, as well, about moving away from the U.S. dollar, the de-dollarization, I think, is how it was being phrased, which a lot of African countries have to deal in uh, when it comes to international uh, trade. So what would be ideal, do you think, as head of trade? Is it uh, looking at the local currency or a currency for, for Africa? What would that even look like? I think foremost that the reason why it's so topical again now and um, this dependency on the dollar is because so much of African trade actually depends on access to the dollar. If African countries want to trade with each other, in most instances, the dollar is required. Even with Africa's biggest trading partner, China, a majority of that trade still happens using uh, the dollar. So the moment that interest rates rises in these markets, the foreign debt that these countries have to pay uh, increases. It means the dollar liquidity in these markets reduce, meaning that there's less money going around to, to fund imports, critical imports. Africa is a net importer. Uh, and without dollars uh, in these markets, it's, it's very, very difficult to stimulate these, mm. these respective um, countries. So that, that dependency is there. There's a, there's a significant need to diversify that dependency, whether that's by using the Chinese renminbi as an example, or thinking about other alternatives. I think we often get carried away by, by the ideal of an, of an African currency. Um, I think that would naturally be be an ideal, but it is so complex um, yeah. that we got to focus on more practical reasons, like for instance the Pan Africa Payments and Settlement System that the AFCFTA is trying to roll out. Uh, one of those, I suppose, is going to be fairly obvious uh, to say, a lot more complicated uh, to implement, is that of the increasing of trade from African countries as well. How does a currency affect uh, trade within Africa at the moment? Because without being able to stimulate trade, we're going to see a slowdown of economic growth. If we see a slowdown of economic growth, we're going to see a, a weakening of the local currency. We're then going to see an increase in interest rates and inflation. And here we are on that hamster wheel, Philip, going round and round and round. Yeah, absolutely. So that's where, for instance, the example of PAPS comes comes into play is that if we can at least make it easier for money to flow between African markets where businesses can pay in local currency and receive in local currency, uh, financial institutions can play a role in that, central banks can play a role in that, it, it would certainly stimulate or reduce the friction currently in the market. Of course, we know that uh, trade is inhibited in Africa, not just by the currency challenges, there's a multitude of tariff and non-tariff barriers that, that are hampering trade. And that's why 18% of, of Africa's trade is with itself, with its, which is a, a remarkably low number. Um, and, and, and I think whether you look at government policies or private sector, we all have a role to play in, in reducing those, those barriers to trade.
And one of those, I imagine, could be the African continental free trade area as well. If I remember uh, research from earlier in the year, if that were to come into play, it could very well be uh, one of the largest markets globally, not just within Africa, but actually on a global scale. Uh, what, what's your sense of, of where we are on that and its uh, efficacy? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the AFCFTA, the African Continental Free Trade Area, is certainly not just an idea anymore. It's very much in play. The majority of countries have ratified it. And slowly but surely, you can start seeing um, the progress being made. Of course, the intention of the AFCFTA is to alleviate tariff barriers as well as, as non-tariff barriers. Of course, the tariff barriers speak for themselves. The non-tariff barriers, as the trade barometer again has showed us uh, in this, this third edition, is absolutely massive, whether you talk about uh, the big one, which is infrastructure, within infrastructure, yeah. the power issues that we have in, on the continent, the challenges with our ports, the railway networks, the road networks. These are all things that via the AFCFTA trying to stimulate the right engagements between governments, between private sectors um, to support this infrastructure, which is much needed um, to, to stimulate better trade within the continent. And I suppose there's this knock-on effect again, isn't it? That if there's uh, less investment, there's less uh, stimulus within the economy as well. What we end up with, and it's a sad state of affairs for most African countries, and I don't mean to stereotype, but the numbers back this, we end up in a continent that's over-indebted to other countries. We have to then end up paying money just to pay for the loans to do the basics we want to do, and we never actually grow. We just keep servicing debt. A absolutely, absolutely. And that's that's a significant challenge. So, so we got to we got to change some fundamentals in this business and, and uh, in, in in on the continent to stimulate uh, business. What we are seeing is you're seeing major infrastructure projects, as an example, happening in in multiple countries. If you just look at port infrastructure, there's been multiples more infra infrastructure investment into ports capability the last 15 years than the previous 15 years. But it's simply not enough. Whether you look at the big rail projects. Uh, in the, using the SGR as an example in East Africa or the big road projects happening in Mozambique and Zambia. These are fantastic projects and they're making a major impact, but it's just not enough considering the backlog of infrastructure challenges that we have. We've got urbanization happening at a rapid rate. We've got a growing population in many of these countries. So we just cannot at this point in time keep up with that growth with the, with the infrastructure projects in hand. And then we get into this unfortunate spiral um, that you're talking about. What, what is our African solution in a case like this? Because, yes, when we talk the dollar, we're talking first world uh, country. When we talk about uh, the Chinese currency, obviously one of the most developed economies in the world. It's an unfair barometer, if I can steal that turn of phrase, to compare us, South Africa, and Africa, arguably, uh, to those countries because of historical reasons. We can save that conversation for another day. But what's an African solution for an African problem? Intertrade, for example. You're absolutely right. We often do comparisons to the EU, which is which is unfair. If you think the EU in itself took over 40 years to, to get into place, uh, which many people forget. It's less countries. They were more developed at the time. And one could argue certainly less complex than what we have on the African continent. The, 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 the answer lies in some solidarity. The answer lies in getting around the table and agreeing on some of these fundamentals, which the AFCFDA is trying to stimulate. How do we agree on dispute resolution between countries of trade between countries uh, you know if there's a dispute in place how do we create uh, certainty around investment and making sure that those protocols in place we have to stimulate a, a, an environment that's that creates certainty for for foreign investors and for investors within africa to invest in, in other markets but unfortunately when you come to these uh, engagements around the table there's still very much each country thinking about their own politics come into play uh, uh, power struggles come into play, which is which is deeply unfortunate. But mm. you, we have to we have to look at the bigger picture here. There's a there's a massive opportunity to stimulate uh, these respective economies by by coming around the table as an African continent. Uh, and as I say goodbye to you, uh, Philip, uh, I obviously understand you work for a financing group, but I'm curious, how does trade finance work on the African continent? If you look at yourself at Standard Bank, but also if you take a look at uh, providing everything beyond hard infrastructure, there's a lot of legislation, there's a lot of red tape. How does a bank, how does the trade financing get made easier? Without that, everything we've discussed simply won't happen. Yeah, absolutely. The financial institutions have a key role to play in all of this. There's probably three obvious components to it. 
The one is trade finance. The second one is making payments more frictionless across the continent. And the third one is we have a significant role to play in, in funding the infrastructure the investment that's, that's required. Just on trade finance specifically, I think banks have to do a lot better at understanding the needs of SMEs on the continent. I think we're making very good progress on that. But there are significant challenges that often outside of our control. If you think about the rising interest rates, that immediately makes access to finance more difficult for small businesses. That's what the barometer told us again in this issue. If you look at Mozambique as an example, the Reserve Bank there, more than doubled the reserve capital reserve requirements in those markets. So immediately, banks have to hold more capital uh, to adhere to central bank regulations, which means there's less capital in the market. So uh, you know, the banks at some at some stages are, are fighting with, with one hand behind their back in, in, in instances like this. But I can sh surely tell you that there's an intent to, to, to fix it because it's a massive opportunity for the banks, of course. Yeah, it's a massive stumbling block, but it is, as you say, uh, Philip, a very good uh, and big opportunity as well. My thanks to you. Hopefully we'll talk again. Philip Myberg, head